Hey, it's Chronologically Gaming, the only channel that's perpetually retro because we're playing every video game in order of release. Imagine a time before uh, loot boxes, before they had season passes, before there was pay-to-play video games. They were something that you held in your hand. They were on cassette, they were on disc, they were on cartridge. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the beginning of May 1982, where we play everything here. And we last played Cannonball Blitz. Let's press forward and see our next game. The next place we're going is the Commodore VIC-20, and this is The Catch. Why buy just a video game from Atari or Intellivision? Why and buy just a video game? The for under oh, the Wonder Computer. Commodore Unlike games, it has a real computer keyboard. Ooh. With the Commodore VIC-20, the whole family can learn computing at home. Or so just this one child. <laughs> Under three hundred dollars, the Wonder Computer of the nineteen eighties. The, the Commodore Wonder 20. Computer. And soon, Commodore brings you Gorf, the Wonder Arcade game. Oh, Wonder Arcade, Arcade games. A couple of ones we already checked out on the show. Thanks, William Shatner. We're going to check those out. So this is the catch for the Commodore VIC twenty. Let's take a look at the box for the catch. This one is by two different publishers. First one was Nufkop. And this one is the box that is a little different than the, the crazy ones we've seen by Nufkop. So the Unexpanded Vic, but wow, it is a crazy messed up... I, I guess they're using something from Kaboom or Avalanche is the gameplay, but uh, I, maybe they think Gorilla Cell, so just slap a gorilla on the front of the box and the catch will work. Gotta catch whatever he's throwing at you. And there's the cassette tape. This is the other publisher, Rabbit Software, that you could also see on the Commodore Vic-20. And just an example of the screenshot. Any other versions we have is just the alternate version. Let's pop in and play The Catch. Released the beginning of May 1982. Developed by Scott Elder. Way to go, Scott. And published by Nufkop. The Catch. Once again, the Commodore VIC-20, because of the limited color palette, some of the times the text is hard to see. The Catch by Scott. You can barely see the white on yellow. And we've seen a few games that do that. I don't know whose decision it was for that. So we have a shield. We can defend cities. And we're going to be able to use the Commodore VIC-20 joystick for this one. So let's push our action button and we're in. It is a bare bones avalanche variant, very similar to Kaboom or a few others that we've seen before. This one's doing better than the last title that we checked out. That was a, a variant like this, but it still isn't using the paddle controls. And that's where I'd say this gameplay is the best. If you don't have paddle controls, it's really not doing it the same justice. So you notice that it's slightly where I'm able to catch everything that comes down if I'm quick enough. And there isn't a lot of nuance because this, the, the joystick's only giving me one speed. Oh, wow. But they are definitely picking up the speed. So as long as I keep in touch with everything on the screen and don't lose focus whatsoever, I'll be able to catch everything that drops. But I can't, vary, I can't, I can't do variations of my speed. It's just going to be the same thing every single time. Gosh. <laughs> Is it going to go faster than that? Oh my gosh. <laughs> See, I made fun of the game and it just slapped me in the back of the head. There you go. Wow, you have to zone out. Why haven't I had game over? I thought it dropped some. <laughs> oh my gosh. Some of the reasons why children went blind in 1982. So if you look at the bottom of the screen, we had small cities. Those small cities need to stay on the screen and they get bombed. All the cities get bombed, then you're you're done. But we do have a shield button. It says the joystick or keys Z for left. C. So if you're using the keyboard control, C for right. And then it has uh, move shields. Okay, so we are the shield. I thought there was a shield button, but no, it's that, that's all it is. And then repeat ad nauseum as usual. So there's the catch for Commodore VIC-20. I actually say it's better considering we don't use the paddle control. It's pretty good still for the time. I'm going to go around average, three stars. Perfectly average for what you see in 1982. So fun for the Commodore VIC-20. Let's press forward and see our next game. We're now going to the Atari home computer, and this is Cavern Battle. Let's take a look at Cavern Battle starting with the artwork. This one's part of Compute's second book of Atari. So it's another one of those type-in games, but you did it from not a magazine, but from a book. Let's see what other... We have no other manual or any other information, so we're going to just type in and play Computes by David N. Plotkin. Way to go, David. This is the beginning of May 1982, and I guess you could say since this isn't physical media, this is the closest we're going to get to cloud gaming, of what we consider it now, 
where you don't you're not really holding the game in the palm of your hand. But these are the kind of games we didn't play every type in game here on the channel because there are so many type in games. But this is the kind of games that you'll see the most experimentation of. Let's see what would work for a video and what won't work. And it's kind of fascinating to check that out. So you can see we're still loading. Come on, there we go. We're, okay, we're in. So this one, I'm uh, controlling a play at the top of the screen. We have a very, very dull color scheme here on the Atari 800, so you can barely see the plane. And I have two enemies that are chasing me. But this is what's bizarre about the controls. I have the Atari VCS joystick plugged in. To go down in the cavern, I have to push, pull up on the joystick. So I'm literally moving up on my Atari VCS joystick to go down away from the enemies. And if I hit my red button, okay, it just shoots... <laughs> It shoots off a very, very slow-moving missile. And if I want to move left and right, I still can, but I cannot simultaneously move down and move to the sides at the same time. Yeah, it does not work. Wow, so very, very clunky. But here's the thing. We're playing a shoot 'em up where the only place you go is down. And we have, obviously have two enemies that we can fight. I can fire off missiles there. Oh, wow, they're coming at me quicker now. It looks like I just clipped through an enemy. I don't think I'm going to see, or we haven't seen any shoot 'em ups that do this where we're starting at the top of the screen, we go down, and I guess Caverns of Mars, but it's not really, it wasn't really a shoot 'em up You were more dodging things. This is actually shooting enemies while traveling down, and obviously we're using the joystick the wrong direction. We have to go up on the joystick to go down in the cavern, and then push in, uh, fire at enemies left and right. Oh, I can even land on my own, oh gosh. I can fire the missile off and land on my own missile if I'm fast enough. <laughs> so, uh, obviously today's standard of jank is hell, but I applaud trying something that's never been done before. Let's try a shooter instead of going left to right like uh, Defender or Star uh, Stargate and things like that. This one is going top down and just trying something different. Does it hit this mark? No, and the controls are a, a big representation of that. All right, so there you go. That is Cavern Battle. Uh, of all the games we've seen up to this point, I gotta give it bad. It's trying something new, and you could play it for a little bit of time because it, anything that's not staying on one screen is still fascinating. So I'm still gonna say two stars, but still bad for the time, considering all the other games you could play. All right, so that is Cavern Battle. And with that, let's press forward and see our next game. We're on the brand new ZX Spectrum, and this is City Bomber. Another Blitz variant, and there's tons of Blitz variants. We need to put in bets now. Which video game, of all the video games we've seen, is going to have the most clones? Because we've seen Star Trek games, and we've seen a lot of Star Trek variant games, and there's going to be a lot later. There's also seen Pac-Man clones. We've also seen, once, once a game is really popular, there's tons and tons of variants. So Blitz is, is getting up there. Is how many Blitz variants are they going to have? Which one is going to come out on top as we play every single video game? So this is City Bomber. This one, we don't really have a lot of information like box art, but we do have a makeshift, yeah, makeshift manual. So a homemade one. You can see it's just text. It's a simple version game of uh, where you bomb all the buildings before you land. So it's a, a, it is the Blitz variant to play. But this one's kind of special because it is another early title by Jeff Minter. And we have a few optional versions we could play. Let's pop in the cassette and play City Bomber in the beginning of May 1982 by Jeff Minter, published by Llamasoft. Oh yeah, Llamasoft. It's been said Jeff Minter made everything llama because people complained that the the walkers that he designed for the Star Wars game looked like llamas. And so I guess he just went with it and said, everything's going to be llama now. My company, everything I make for video games is going to be llamas. And we're going to see even more llama games by Jeff Minter. All right, so instructions or info. We'll push I. Your ship is in trouble over an enemy city. You must bomb. The, oh, they're using symbols again. Bomb the city flat to land your pilot safely. Press a letter key to bomb. Your plane descends with every press over the city, hit any building or rubble, and bam goes the, the thing. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, we need to see those Lamasoff ads. Those are those are awesome. Yeah, send them my way, please. Look at the, what he's doing with the color, though, for the ZX Spectrum. That's pretty cool. Nice. And it's new. ZX Spectrum is so new. All right, what skill level do we want? We are pros here with Blitz Fairings. We'll go four. Entry wave. Let's go three. <laughs> yes. I hope I haven't caused any seizures on the channel because this is 1982. If you have problems with seizures, you probably shouldn't be watching games from 1982. But I can't tell you how to live your life, so I will say please close one eye if you're sensitive to flashing lights because they're everywhere. So here it is. If you haven't seen it before, this is a Blitz variant. 
another title that isn't based on the very first game, like I thought, called Blitz. It, it was an early title called Blitz, but it's the idea of you push one button and you're just trying to get all the buildings to be flattened down before you get to the bottom. I would say that uh, Canyon Bomber was one of the first games that, that we ever saw on the channel do this in the arcades. They had a more point-based, though. It wasn't um, a strategy to take the buildings down at a certain place so you can land the plane. It was just, you know, bomb everything you can in sight and get points for it. But it's not really a shoot -em up because you're not shooting forward. You're just dropping bombs. And it looks like we are going to crash because you got to get the plane down in the right spot. You see, I'm t knocking down the taller buildings if I can. There we go. I'm probably going to hit that when I come around. Let's see. Not looking good. We did play a Blitz variant where it had flags at the top of the building, and if you hit the flags, then you went down. But even still, it's one button. There's not a lot of gameplay here to play City Bomber. This is it. <laughs> we get a colorful pow, and game over. Thanks, Jeff Minter. We will see a lot more of that developer. He's awesome. Okay, so this is another game that I gotta say, it, it, because of the gameplay, I'm still gonna say around the average, but it's still not as impressive as the other games that are an average title. So I'm gonna say two and a half stars for City Bomber. It's done well if you wanna play a Blitz variant, but if that's all you got, then I mean, what's the point, right? All right, so after City Bomber, our next game is City Bomber. A totally different City Bomber. These, while they had the same name, they technically weren't released exactly the same time. I'm just putting them together because it's pretty much the same game by two different developers. Another one that we don't have a box for, let's pop in and play City Bomber by Creative Software, developed by Vicsoft, beginning of May 1982. Another one, and this one doesn't run, but we've seen City Bomber, that's why I put video footage on the left side. So there you go. Undefined statement error in 15. If you wanna make this City Bomber run, please let me know. In the meantime, we're still gonna say it's subpar. Two and a half stars for City Bomber. You know what though? Because of this, isn't have the cool. I, I would say it's it, it's a little slightly cooler on the ZX Spectrum. So I'll do two stars for City Bomber on the Commodore VIC-20. How many other Blitz variants are we gonna have? Place your bets now. And with that, let's press forward and see our next game. Yeah, it's time to go to the Arcadia 2001 by Emerson, and this is Crazy Climber. Gaylords has the hot new TV video game, the Emerson Arcadia 2001, for under $100, just $99.94. It is a very bizarre Plus price. free Alien Invader cartridge, regularly $29.95. Imagine all of this for under $100. You gotta go where the go-getters are. You gotta go. You gotta go. Yes, to buy the hot new TV video game. I forget they call them that. I have to remind myself. Keep calling them TV video games. Oh, that's true. I just saw in the chats, yeah, we need to have Breakout. That's the king. That should be the king of all the clones because and since the beginning of time, or at least video game time, I, I'm, my bets would be on Breakout as well. So that's a good shout out. Let's take a look at the box for Crazy Climber for the Arcadia 2001. Once again, didn't get an actual physical scan. This is a reconstructed box. Close as we kid though of what it would look like to have Crazy Climber on your Arcadia 2001. This is the very first time anyone's ported Crazy Climber from the arcades or tried Crazy Climber. There is no one that's made a game that's like Crazy Climber. This is the only one you could play outside the arcades the very first time. So that's already impressive in its own right. Any other artwork we have for Crazy Climber that you can finally play at home. Just an example of a cartridge and a screenshot. And that's it. Now the manual we have is another homebrew manual. You can see it's a text one only, but this is all we got. I couldn't find any physical scans for this. Every step you climb earns you points. Be careful of the falling objects and closed windows. If you're hit, you'll fall down and only get five men on your team. The objective is to score points by climbing the building. The climber will fall if they're hit by a falling object or climbs into a closed window. Five climbers are available in each game and there are four levels of difficulty. Before you get started, it explains, once again, on these home consoles, I guess they put the instructions for, like, idiots because they expect people to own a home console. You don't even know how to work the television. So make sure the power switch of the console is off, plug it into your television, you know, the, all the, 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 the things you should know if you bought the console, or at least the instructions of the console. And then you only use the right controllers used, and the keys and the keypad are functionless. So this is another game that is not using the left for first player. It's using the opposite controller. So I actually have to plug in two controllers and use one for the gameplay. And it's kind of curious because Crazy Climber had a unique control scheme where you were controlling the limbs of the character. And so they, you can't really translate that on the, at home. This is using a joystick that's very similar to the Intellivision controller. The numpad and everything. 
All right, so here we got four different levels of difficulty in the game. Basic level comprises windows will open, close gradually at random. And so the color of the window indicates whether it's open. Yellow is open and closed is green. Closing window will shut the climber off and cause him to fall down. Space between windows are danger level, which a climber can be hit by falling objects. However, if a climber is hit at the window level, he be sheltered from the falling objects and avoid being hit. <laughs> hey, welcome, welcome. So we got four pictures showing open and closed windows. Different window structures, windows closing. Okay, so it's basically breaking down what you're going to see on the screen because most likely you don't understand when a window's open or closed, is my guess. And then how do you play the game? This is similar to the Atari 2600 where you push the buttons on the console for how you want to play. So if you look down here in the bottom left corner, there's the Emerson 2001. Kind of small to see, but the two joysticks or hand controllers have Intellivision-like overlays. You'll, you'll slide over the top, use the numpad, and then the joystick itself. But then in the center, there's buttons for selecting the game options and then pushing start. So we'll be doing that as well. That's why this console, they usually put in as the uh, second generation still of consoles. All right, so here we go. Let's pop in and play Crazy Climber. The beginning of May, 1982, by Nihon Busan and UA Limited that did this one. Hey, there we go, a console playing a Diddy for us. That's nice. And rare. So we can push the option button. This is me pushing it on the console and you can do levels one through four. Press A to select the level and game start, let's go. Push and start, we are in. And bear in mind, I'm using the other controller, which you would usually designate as the second player controller. So a little bizarre, but here, we're in. All I'm having to do is move the joystick. So the controls really don't use, yeah, I'm trying different things on my number pad. Nothing's coming up. All it is is the movement. Get your guy to the top, score more points. Oh, and we have falling debris. So there, there's the, what they explain in the manual. It is open and close windows with green and yellow to let you know when you're going to slip out, out, out a window, I guess. So the, the big draw of the arcade version of Crazy Climber was the control scheme. You moved... Oh, I barely dodged that one. You moved yourself with the limbs of the character, like your left arm, then your right arm, and your right leg, and your left leg, and you have to work that, uh, or figure that out to make yourself move to the top of the tower. This one's pretty standard, though. All I have to do is use the joystick. <laughs> See, I got in the window in the wrong spot, and it dropped me down. So, yellow's good, green bad. At least when it closes all the way. And once again, the color scheme, mixing the white and yellow is really hard to see. I just got, I got bonked in the head and I was okay. But all you gotta do is move up, down, left and right. And you don't have to worry about your limbs like it did with Crazy Climber. But this was developed by the same developers in Japan when it first was released. And of course this was in Japan. The console was called the Bandai Arcadia. Yeah, we're going to see that later, the Spidey one. That's a good shout-out. As far as what we've seen, this is the only way you could play Crazy Climber at home or anything like that. Nothing's been on the computer, computers for Crazy Climber. Nothing's been on any other console games. This is the very first. Which is kind of nice because um, Nihon Busan got it uh, set up on, or got the rights to be able to get this one out on the home console. This is pretty cool. Now, if the windows do close, it limits my movement. I cannot move in certain places, too. <laughs> and if you touch the green window, you're falling down. Yep, oh yeah, going down. Alright, so I want to check out the other game modes just to see if there's any difference for it. Um, I guess I gotta hit reset. Is it a quit the whole thing? I want to see if they give us different levels or if they look pretty much the same. And of course, after reset, the high score is gone. Does not save it. All right, so we got level two, three. Let's see what four looks like. Level four. Doesn't even look like a building. We're climbing a space age structure. Yeah, where's the windows? It's it now looks like vortexes we're going through, which I think the manual explains what this is because it no longer looks like we're climbing a building. And we got space age stuff being thrown at us from the top of the building. But gameplay-wise, um, it's not doing what Crazy Climber was meant to do, but it still works really well. You just move around left and right and climb to the top. Scroll slowly to the top of the screen. 
and the higher you get, the more points you get. So it does give you the draw of let's try to get higher. Let's try to go as far as we can or a little bit further in the game. I dig that. So that's Crazy Climber. Of all the games we've seen to this point, it's still pretty good. I'd say above average. I'd even go as high as saying it's a four-star game. If you think of all the other games you could play on a console, it's pretty good. So I'm going four stars. All the console games out there, Crazy Climber's up there. It's pretty nice. It's not one of the best, but still excellent. All right, and with that, let's press forward and see our next game. We're now going to the Atari home computer, and this is Cribbage. For all those fans that were begging for Cribbage, can we play Cribbage as a video game? Here it is. This one is first made by APX. If we take a look at the box, it's really just the Atari Program Exchange usual box. One player English card game. That's right. Cribbage. And you bet you, you bet on this live stream, we're not going to be actually playing a long game with Cribbage. So there's Advertiser Flyer by APX. Programs for users by users. Sometimes they hit, sometimes they don't. But hey, if you wanted cribbage, this is the only way, or one of the only ways. So we got the manual for this one. How do you play cribbage? Well, I don't even know how to play cribbage. But this, hopefully the manual tells you how to play if you wanted to. But just imagine that if you, uh, it, it's a unique card game of skill and chance is what it says. But imagine at the time when you wanted to play a, a game, but you have to have other people. If you don't have other people with you, then the computer can be that, those other people. That's what the computer is. It's like you don't need friends anymore. Thank you, computers. The cribbage board with 60 holes for each player, 30 each way is the racetrack, pitting your ability to assemble and count combinations of 15 straights, pairs, and flushes against the computer's ability. You try to peg twice around the board before the computer can do the same. Each round of play has two phases, head-to-head -head card playing when you try to outwit and outpeg the computer, and hand counting during which your ability to make four cards hands out of six cards is pitted against the computer. So this is one player only. You cannot play this with other people, which I think they said on the front of the box, right? One player only? Yeah, one player version. So you can't even play with other people if you wanted to. Let's pop in and play some cribbage. The beginning of May 1982 by Jose R. Suarez. Way to go, Jose. Let's see what you got. <laughs> it's kind of like when we play video games that are tic-tac-toe. You know, We understand how to play the game, but is it enjoyable or would you want to? But at this point, 1982, you got to imagine we're so early in video games that this is just unique and cool to see something that you that you can play as a video game. Look at this. Great presentation, though. i got to give him that. And, oh, that's nice. I got my Atari VCS joystick plugged in. I'm controlling it with that. So if you want to do it, yeah, we were definitely a raw beginner, <laughs> which I've never been <laughs> referred to as, as that before. I'm a raw beginner. So computer's dealing first. Shows us our card because we put them down. Looks like they got higher than us. And then there is us. S study your hand while I discard. Already right off the bat, the presentation is very, very good. And look at this. I Oh, man. Yep, it controls with the joystick. So the user interface is so easy. And then I would push the red button. Two cards for the crib. Bam. Put them down. And then we begin. Yeah, it's being controlled with the, the joystick. So that's already a plus. It is a single, a single player game, though. If your buddies, if your cribbage team or buddies don't want to play with you, then you can always practice here, I guess. Oh, I'm sorry. I must play. I don't know the rules. Peg zero points. Oh, okay. And then you use the pegboard <laughs> to move it around. But it's all controlled with the VCS joystick. That is awesome. Now, Cribbage, uh, I can't really get too excited about it. Of all the games we've seen at this point, it's programmed very, very well. It's exactly what you would want to play and a very well done game. But it, Cribbage depends on, you know, how well you, how, how much do you really want to play Cribbage? So I'm going to put it right down the middle. It's a three star game. It's, uh, it's done very well as far as programmed. And it's a, a, an excellent title, especially for Cribbage. But it's not really like the most ideal video game or the most impressive video game. Oh, that's true. If you want to get older people to buy the computer, get Cribbage on there. That's a good point. Yeah, I always ask the demographic because at this point, it, it could be anybody and everybody. It, it, since we're in the Wild West of developing video games, th these could be made for younger kids. We have edu educational titles. And then we have things that are ex extremely violent that are out there. We have things that are testing you know, wh what would be interesting for strategy games. And then we have these too, the card games or, or games that like bowling, things that uh, you, you wouldn't expect a teenager to play. They're all It's all over the place. I love it. And with that, let's press forward and see our next game. All right, time to go to England. Now, this one is what they saw on television at the time in the UK. Good morning, sir. Oh, good morning. Um, I'd like to buy a computer. Certainly, sir. 
What did you have in mind? Well, I don't know very much about computers. Perhaps you could give me some advice. Then get out. Well, there's the apple, the acorn, the pear. The banana? Yes. Uh, we have no bananas. Yes, we have we no have bananas. Tangerines. Um, but we do have tangerines. Got to do with computers? Well, sir, you know what it says in the Bible? Be fruitful and multiply. I, I really wanted something electronic. Disc or cassette? No, no, not hi-fi. You know, you'd be happy with a pet. <laughs> I had really set my heart on a computer. You want to try watching the new TV series, sir? The Computer Program. The Computer the Program, computer. yes. That goes with it. And there it is. That's what we're playing on the BBC mm -hmm. Micro. Um, the Beeb. Have you got one in blue? <laughs> he looks so happy about it. Take a look you at the Beeb. You don't know much about computers, do you, sir? No. But I know what I like. And he's out of here. He's going to learn more about computers. And that's what they did. They had this program up so that people could learn more about computers. Because at the time, this is the beginning of the UK rise in technology or information technology. And the game we're going to be playing is Cube Master. I'll give you one guess what Cube Master is. Let's take a look at the box for Cube Master for the BBC Micro Model B. Got more memory on that one. As we flip it over the back, oh, that's funny. The front is reconstructed, but the sides are all messy and dirty. I love it. It contains everything we need to play Cube Master, a cube-solving pr program in which the computer will shuffle and solve a cube on the screen. So it's a Rubik's Cube game, but they're not allowed to say the word Rubik's. A special feature of the program is its cube drawing facility. It allows you to draw any cube on the screen and then step through the solution at your chosen speed. That's nice. Oh, they also advertise Arcadians on here, too. That's cool. Because we played that one too. And I think we're going to be checking out Meteors at some point. All right. So, yeah, not the Cubert one yet. We don't even know what Cubert is. What's Cubert? I, I don't even know what that is. What other artwork do we have for Cube Master? We just have the cassette tape. It contains Cube because that's what you're going to be typing in whenever you want to play the game. And we have a lot of alternate versions. We're going to play the first one. Here it is Cube Master, the beginning of May 1982 on your BBC Micro. We just type in the commands to play. Oh, you need a lot. Most likely, we're going to have loading instructions for everything we'll be playing on cassette in the UK. And we're in. This is it. This is Cube Master. So they give you the commands on the screen. Yeah, this is not controlled with a joystick. You use uh, uh, U to go up and then hit Enter. And then it actually takes the up tile and you can see it's spinning it around. And we see both sides of the cube at the same time. That's me just doing up. If I want to move right, I can slide the right one around. And it's, it's actually... A pretty cool idea when we, considering the other cube games we played. I mean, but look at the color. The color pops. It is so nice on the Beeb. And if I want to move uh, L, so all the commands are there. All you're doing is solving a Rubik's Cube on your screen. So once again, would it be more impressive to have a Rubik's Cube or to play this one? And I got to say, for all the Rubik's Cube games, we usually rate them slightly below average. But I'd say this one's right down the middle. I'll say three stars for Cube Master. It's uh, got uh, good colors. The sh shows the presentation of, of solving a Rubik's cube, and it's all right for the time. I mean, I'm sure lots of people were entertained playing this for you know, a few minutes at least. So there's Cube Master. Let's see what else May has in store for us as we press forward. All right, next one is on the Atari home computer. This is Defend. Just Defend, not Defender. Just Defend. Another title we don't have a box for. Just a few screenshots. We have, okay, so we have a cracked version and a normal version. This is one of the first uh, titles that's made by an actual BBS, or at least they call themselves Arcade and Grass BBS. So a bulletin board, first one, Jack and Ron, way to go. Let's play some Defend on our Atari home computer. Jack, oh, I don't know how to pronounce the name, Snow Yink and Rob Kramer, and then revised by Jim Steinbrecher. All right, so here's how it works. We can use the home computer to play, pushing start to begin, and I'm going to see if... Yes, push the select button. We can go either novice or expert. That's it. There's no other option. Let's go expert and see what happens. Push and start. And we are in. So I am in the center of the screen. Oh, I'm stuck. So defend. I am one ship in the center, but I cannot do anything. I can, I can only sh uh, shoot side to side. Wow. So again, another bizarre control scheme. Almost like they're testing out what, we, what can we do for the Atari home computer. I cannot. I can't move horizontally like in Defender. I can just go up and down and then turn left and right. So another control scheme or a shoot 'em up that we've never seen before. Let's just have the player move up and down and then shoot left and right and that's it. 
it's experimenting, and I can tell why most more people didn't do it. It's not as fun as Space Invaders. If you're at the bottom of the screen, even that kind of fixed shooter is more fun than this. But it is different because the enemies are flying at us from different directions, so it's kind of all over the place. It's not aliens slowly moving in slowly. And you notice that the enemies are all the same. It just feels like I'm do doing a... a so, full disclosure, every game we play here on the show it has to be a release. It can't be a prototype. It can't be almost finished or completed. It has to be a, a completed game. Even if that's a typing game that possibly has bugs, we play those. And so this feels like it's it, we're just experimenting. Like we're playing, what if we... Someone said, what if we made a shoot -em up that you don't even move left and right, you just stay in the center. Would that be fun? Let's try it. That, that's what it feels like I'm playing right now. So it's not a... It doesn't feel like I'm playing a completed game. What, did I already... What, is there a time limit or something? <laughs> it just ended the game right there. And we didn't go to any other screens. That's all we got for the fixed screen. It's the same. Not variations of enemies on the screen. And they're trying something different, so I applaud them for that. But it's just not done as well. So I don't want to say it's bad. Uh, you, you could get some enjoyment out of it and play it. I'm going to say two and a half stars. You can... I understand why this wasn't done again. <laughs> Chip is going way low. Yeah. Close to the broken range. Yeah, I can understand that too. It, it's still playable and works, and it, it's all right, but uh, I wouldn't say it's as good as that. All right, so there's Defend. Now let's see where we're going. What's happening now? It's time to go to the TRS-80, and this is Desert Isle. Let's take a look at Desert Isle starting with the box. Now this one I found lots of artwork for. You can use it on your Model 1 or Model 3. Got some coconuts falling from the palm tree there. Flip it over the back, and this is a windstorm's blowing the coconuts from the palm trees. You have to dodge them to stay alive. You set the speed, and the machine language plays with speed and sound. You need 16K to play this one. And machine language, and that's pretty nice. Pretty nice. And the other are we have for Desert Isle. We also have the instructions of how to play, how to load the game, and the game ends after you've been hit five times by a coconut, so it's dodging coconut games. Desert Isle is another title that we do not have a game for. I couldn't find... I have, I have three different repositories of all TRS-80 games. It, this doesn't exist there. But it's, it's strange because I found the artwork, like you'd see the box, that's a scan that came in. But I couldn't get it. So if you've got Desert Isle for us to check out, we'll come back and play this. But in the meantime, we're going to go for uh, two stars for Desert Isle. So to show you what it kind of looks like, this is the screen of Desert Isle. It is coconuts or the circles, and then you're trying to get from one end of the screen while the coconuts are flying across. And with an instruction title there. All right, so if, I'd love to play it, but can't find this one. And I look all over the place for it. So if you got Desert Isle, send it my way. And with that, let's press forward and see our next game. We're back on the Commodore VIC-20, and this is Dragons and Treasure. Please do not play Atari 2600 like the kid on the left. Your eyesight may go go pretty bad. All right, so this one is another one we don't have any artwork for. Let's pop it and play Dragons and Treasure by Brad Hoke and, and Dwayne Hoke. Way to go, Brad and Dwayne, and published by Com Data. Now, this one is a really long title to load, so I'm going to cheat a little bit, and we're going to load up so we can go right into the action. And what level do we want to play? Level number one. So if the satanic panic is happening right now, why are so many games being put out to encourage witchcraft and dungeons and dragons and all that stuff because wouldn't that mean your game wouldn't sell very well if you uh tried to sell something doing magic and uh in demons and so forth i mean we played lucifer's realm I i'm pretty sure that one didn't sell well if everyone was that scared of, of kids worshiping the devil and stuff <laughs> yeah that's true you make a game that's really controversial. Well, if the magazines publish it, tell it how, t how terrible it is, and everyone wants to check it out. Okay, so we are in. Dragons and Treasure is a roguelike. It starts off with a ra totally randomly generated dungeon. There I am in the center. If I move myself around, it's going to reveal the map slowly to us. And I have an attack. Oh, there we go. I can pick up a treasure. Got some points for it. And I can see, what is this thing? Okay, um, I just broke some brick there. Oh, we got an enemy coming at us. Let's get him. Got him. Destroyed. You saw, saw my sword swing right there. Nice. Work our way around. Reveal some doors. Go in here. Get some more treasure. And now this is all being controlled with the VIC-20 joystick. So as I move, it's it's going to random randomize whether it's a, a rock or an enemy here. Let's see. Okay, we look good. Another one comes out. That must be the dragon. Purple. Don't know what that 
means. So this is one that I couldn't find a lot of information on of, of ex exactly what, what we're playing. Oh, he's got me. He's got me. He's following right on top of me. What in the world? He won't let go. All right, so while we're getting destroyed, this is a just a brief synopsis. The, we control a warrior who moves through a series of randomly generated dungeons and passages and chambers. You can only see a small area around their current location. You try to avoid the dragons. It is a dragon. Collecting treasure. If the player encounters one, they have to. Uh, they will become injured and quickly pass away. There's 10 levels of difficulty. That's pretty much all we got, at least from the Moby Games description. Can I get... Oh, yeah, he destroyed me. And then whenever you die... It uh, boots up and shows you the whole map. So what we would have seen, and it even has markers on the far right and the far left. That's the stairway. So it's a, co a cool idea for a roguelike because it's being controlled with the VIC-20 joystick. You can move that around and use that to attack. And it's pretty simplified for the time. So I'm going to do another one. Let's load it up and see if it's a totally new one. Because they build every time. So let's do again. I'll do level one. And it should be a completely different level. Let's go. I like the idea because it's something new every time you play, and it's controlled with a joystick. It's all, it, it could be considered too simple, but um, I, I, I would get a lot of enjoyment out of this if it was 1982. It's doing the permadeath where you have to get as much points as you can before you die. So loading up. Building the map for us any day now. We're in. Okay, so there I am on the right side of the screen, moving down. Can I go anywhere else? Okay, so it opens up another passage. I got a chest there. Get the dragon while I can. Oh, if the dragon goes into the same space as me, then I think I'm doomed. Yeah, if he shows up in the same area as I am, then there's no way to get... Yeah, he's already destroyed me. If if he's on the, he occupies the same tile as me, that's it. There's also no sound to this one. So a little nuance, but I still got to give it for the roguelike and being controlled with a joystick, which is pretty nice. All right, so for Dragons and Treasure, I'm still going to go about three stars. It's still around the average game you see for the time. If it's an average game, then there's no fault really to it. It's it's a, a typical game, and if it's doing something more or better than the other titles we've seen, that's when we go a little higher. But also go three stars for Dragons and Treasure. All right, with that, let's press forward and see our next game. We're on the Apple II, and this is Dueling Digits. This one has slightly a story for me because... When I first was getting into history of video games and wanting to learn more about video games, I had a book that I read, and it talked about dueling digits in the book. And then when I went online to look up dueling digits, no one had any information at all about this game. And so I ended up putting on different databases information about dueling digits and trying to find uh, physical scans and putting those up there. So this is one of the games that was my inspiration of, wait, if this book says it's a video game, but it's nowhere on the internet. That means there must be games out there we haven't seen. And fast forward about 10 years and here we are playing every single video game. So nothing is left behind. All right, let's take a look at the artwork for Dueling Digits. Don't be expected by something amazing. This one is an educational title. It's a high-res action game. That's just what it says on the front of the box by Brian Crouch. Way to go, Brian. And Broderbund. The front of the box, though, makes it look really cool. Even though it's educational, it is about numbers and doing math. And you, you do pilot ships, but you're you're controlling them from a side view. But, I mean, the, the box art looks awesome. Flip it over the back, and <laughs> the year is 7301 AD. The human race is in a dark age, and the art and science of math is but one of many which are lost, though not entirely forgotten. A place deep in the blasted sands of the San Francisco desert is said to hold these ancient secrets, a place called the Temple of Numbers. People of this future age consider numbers sacred. Using the machines left them by their ancestors, they struggle for the ultimate spiritual discipline, the balanced expression. The human species, long afflicted with a genetic propensity to devalue its strongest asset, the brain, now looks to institute an age of reason based on mathematical certainty. So does that mean this takes place in idiocracy? Or idiocracy? <laughs> Where everyone's an idiot and stupid and they don't even know what numbers and math are? 
So your task is, is to direct a scarab-like crawling spaceship or machine up and down the sandstone walls of the temple, excavating its digit deities. Must battle with the forces of ignorance and your equally dangerous human opponent who seeks to hoard the knowledge and power of mathematics, then grapple the glowing crystalline numbers rising, falling, and changing the air, and hit them into the expression before your rival. So this, this instruction of how the game is played doesn't even feel like an educational title. So this is one of those games that's, is it an action game? Or is it an educational game? It's, it's somewhere like in the bar uh, of, it, you can't really decide. It's, it's, the, it's pure edutainment is what it is. All right, let's take a look at the manual for dueling digits. Same ones we saw before with all its fun. And if you want to, Broder Bun, man, they're a good sport. If your disc wins physically damaged, include $5 for a replacement. So you, you have to have paddles or a joystick plugged into your Apple II for this. And 48K to play this one. Dueling digits. So to control your scarab number collecting machine, you have to use the paddles or joystick. Your object is to shoot floating numbers and mathematical operands and place them down below in a balanced mathematical expression, such as 234 plus 14 equals 248. The computer is not particular about where you leave blank spaces, so it would also accept 234 plus 14 equals 248. Operands can be on either side of the equal sign, and the re result may equal zero. So yes, it is an educational title. It is math. It's uh, balancing out an arcade game and math pretty well, actually, for the time. To begin the equation, you move the paddle and shoot a number, then move your scarab down the main screen and drop it into one of the slots. If you accidentally pick up a number or operand you don't want, you have to position above the garbage hole toward the bottom center of the screen. Press the paddle button to drop the unwanted digit. If at any time you accidentally drop a number in the wrong place, your shows, uh, uh, or your, when you balance out your equation, it doesn't work out well. You can release all the numbers and start over. So if you're playing against two people, that's where this game really shines because it allows two paddles or two joysticks plugged into your Apple II, and you both are playing the game at the same time. So if you got two brainiacs that want to play some math action game, like an arcade game, this is the one to play. And there's the example of the disc. We'll go back to that manual if we need to. Let's pop in the disc and play Dueling Digits. The beginning of May in 1982. Dueling Digits. Was not expecting I would get to this game. A title that I only heard about from a book on the history of video games. Alright, this is it. Number of players, one or two. Now, if I do two players, I don't have two joysticks plugged in. But I'm scared to do a computer because they're probably going to mop the floor with me. Let's go one player. Difficulty, let's go one. And here we are. I'm controlling my spaceship on the right side. And so what you do is, uh, you can actually see the enemy, or the, the computer moving theirs on the le left and right. And I went and pick a number. Uh, let's try five. Okay, so we got five. And I'm going to put five down right there. Okay, so we can do five, uh, four. So I'm going to do five plus, oh no, I don't want that. Go back to the trash. So you got to take the, if you have the wrong one, take it over and dump it in the trash. Wait, would it, would it let me? Oh, I didn't let me do it that time. And the other enemy, when you're firing left and uh, on, on, you can only fire to the left or right, depending on what side you're on. And the enemy can fire at you, which essentially just erases what you picked up. So they're just hampering your equation building. So if I, I'm waiting for some operand. I want to do five plus something, but it's not showing up on the screen. So you just have to wait till one, another one shows up and then fire on it. There's like equals. I'll take that, put an equals in there, and you can have as many spaces as you want. So if you look down at the bottom, that's my equation that's starting to build down here. There's the plus. Okay, do the plus, pop it in there. So five plus four. I'm gonna have to wait for a nine then. Oh, there it is. It's being blocked. No, I got another equals. What happens if I do, oh, if I do two, I can put two equals down there. So you can dump wrong ones. There we go. That, that made it work. Can I pick up another one? No, you have to clear the board. Yeah, so I had to clear since I messed up. I put so much junk down there and start over again. But that's the idea. Playing against the computer is okay. But the the way that Broder was able to mix action as an arcade game and a educational title so well, uh, Dueling Digits is higher marks in my book. And it's also a lot more fun to play if you have someone else with you. So two joysticks played in your Apple II, it's it's a 
like the best edutainment title we've seen so far with dueling digits. I mean, come on, it's a shooter where you're shooting and making equations. So, uh, and it's not marketed for children or young adults. So for dueling digits, I gotta say of all the games we played, it's it's up there. I'm gonna say uh, b b because of the two player factor, I'm gonna go I'm gonna go four stars for dueling digits. It is a well done video game. You're learning math and you're playing and it's an arcade game. Come on, it's fantastic. All right, with that, let's press forward and see our next game. It's time to go to the Z Z ZX81, and this is Dungeons of Doom. So we're going back to England. The rise of UK video gaming. Let's take a look at the box of Dungeons of Doom for the ZX81. Looks like we need 16K for this one. I'm not sure why they designed the box this way. There's some scans we get in front of the boxes that don't really give you the full effect, like if it has uh, holograms or if it's shiny. And so I'm wondering if there's something missing that we see here, because it looks like there's a fade going into the back of the, 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 the box. That's not the real one. Okay, there we go, yeah. So it's a sleeve on the outside. And then you look on the inside, this is the full opened up cassette. <laughs> no, it's all doom here. Everything's negative as far as you want to go to someplace dangerous. And you notice that we play role-playing games or games that involve Dungeons and Dragons. It usually is in a dungeon because of the D&D. &D. It's those D&D &D games. There's too many of them out there. I have seen, though, from epics that have done the science fiction formula. They haven't done just fantasy, but everything else is going to be mostly fantasy. All right, so this is actually two games in one, or two different options of games you can play. Dungeons and Dooms and another one we're going to check, check out. So you can see as we open the whole cassette up, it tells you briefly how to load the game, uh, all with where the rights are, and then it says it's an adventure game for up to four players. Each game is a different layout. Levels are randomly generated, hence the game is different every single time you play. And there's about 400 rooms, 600 corridors to explore. Each room contains either a treasure or a monster. When the treasure's been taken or a monster's been killed, the room will remain empty. And so playing with four people, it's turn-based, but to have that competition is pretty fun, especially on the tiny little ZX81. So you got different options you can, uh, that, that prompts come up. You can do C for combat, S for spell, R for retreat. And again, you have to react fast. They're doing another game where we have to go quick. Quickly, do some movements. And they break down the also movement that we have to move around. How, what, what command do you have to do to move around? All right, let's pop up the cassette and play Dungeons of Doom. Released at the beginning of May 1982 by Simon R. Mansfield. Way to go, Simon. Published by Temptation Software. Boom, chicka, boom, boom. So this is new line to load program. I'm going to go ahead and hit new line. And it gives us the option. We can play Dungeons of Doom or Escape from the Underworld. So no help there, no help there Chip Tune. We'll do Dungeons of Doom. We've just discovered an entrance to the dungeons of a deserted castle. The local villagers have told you that their legends speak of untold wealth. In whispers, they also tell of many brave travelers who have tried to claim the treasure and have never been seen again. That happens a lot in video games. Tales are also told of the one traveler who managed to escape and before dying mumbled stories of hideous monsters inhabiting dungeons of doom. Movement's controlled by the keys 5, 6, 7, and 8. And if that sounds weird, if you look at your keyboard on the ZX81, there they are. 5, 6, 7, and 8 are the cursor keys. On your chiclet keyboard, I might say. If stairs are shown, you can push up and down on the key, or uh, U and D to go up and down. And if you're trapped, you can press E and it'll finish your game. So basically, this game knows that there's times you're going to be totally trapped and can't move around, and there's a kill switch. So if you want to, you can push E and just kill the game. You can find your status by pushing S. And if you encounter a monster, you'll be given a choice, but you have to be quick. And we know you got to be quick. Man, these early role-playing games in the UK, they are brutal with how quick you got to be. Push that button really fast when the monster attacks. Display goes blank for a few seconds uh, when you press new line. Uh, so this means they're telling us, get ready. When you press new line, there's going to be a long loading for Dungeons of Doom before we actually get in the dungeon. I can't remember how long, though. How long are we waiting? But this is a, a computer that is finicky. Every game that you get for the ZX81 or the Timex Sinclair 1000 gives you instructions saying make sure you follow the instructions to a T because there is a lot of keys that will break the game. They will just crash the whole thing. And they know it. So they put in the instructions. Make sure you only push the buttons we tell you to because if you don't, that this game is going to go away. All right, we're in. How many players do we want to play? Let's go all the way. Four players. And player one will be Chrono. Hey, notice that when I'm putting it in, it's not redrawing the whole screen like we've seen on other ZX81 games. So there's Chrono, because we used to do every letter. Let's see, we got 
Chris here in the chat. And we got Chip Tune in the house. And we got Pow. Oh, uh, W didn't work. So Pow Puck is PW. All right, so you use the, the, the movement as the cursor keys to go around, five, six, seven, or eight. So it's build, building this up. And let's see if I try going down, what happens? So this is me. I take my turn. I'm in a corridor, and I've reached a crossover. And that's my turn. So Chrono is done, and now Curtis does their move. And it's kind of bizarre because it's not giving you a lot of instruction of where to go. But you can see because Chrono moved down, I moved down, you can see the bottom intersection. We can't see what's up. So Curtis is going to try going up and see what happens. In the next room, oh, it's a wall. So, so is, is his turn over? So his turn was running into the wall at the top. That, that, that's all I got to do. And we'll try the intersection with Chiptune. Can he go to the right? He can. It's a quarter containing a junction, and then Chiptune's turns over. So this is, how would you play this in, in the UK in 1981? If you had four people, you'd all have to be crowded around that very small computer. And it's hot seat gaming at warp speed. You have to go really, really fast. All right, so Pow will go to the left. And a quarter reached a crossover, so that's their move. And now because each player's tried different ways, the first map we see is going to be different. So now Chrono's going, and we can see a little bit more of what's displayed. And obviously this is going to be random. Every move, every room you get to is going to be a different experience. So let's do go down and see what it is. I don't know if I'm going to hit a wall or not, and I'm not. I'm now in a cave, and there's a giant rat, so now I can choose. Oh, and I was too slow. So we're going to try... Oh, wait. Okay, so I didn't push anything, but it automatically, when the rat tried to attack us, we won. So that's cool. We got lucky that time. Tough luck. He attacks you in terrific battle. You've killed him. Nice. We killed the giant rat. And that's my turn. It's total turn-based. <laughs> the fastest hot seat gaming I think I've seen, where you, you only get one move, and then after that one move, the next person jumps over, takes the chair, and goes. So, Curtis, we're going to go to uh, the right. So he's going to follow what someone else did since he hit a wall. We didn't know it was a wall. He's in the junction again. Chiptune's here. Same junction with uh, Curtis. So kind of difficult to explain unless you play it yourself. Because you, you're not seeing the movement until... I, I know which way I wanted to move. I want to move Chiptune to the right. Now we're in a corridor, reached a crossover. Okay. And that was the stair symbol. So he could choose to go up or down the stairs. And then for Pal, we're going to move this one down. See what happens there. <laughs> well, uh, just on the chat about what Chiptune said, the home computer games, a lot of them are difficult to load, and they're they're, they're finicky, and they, they sometimes will have bugs, which is a reason why when people go through chronology of video games, they don't want to touch the computer, because they're very difficult. I am w wanting to do what no one's done before and play every single game, including computer games. So I'm walking through the sludge and the good ones, because there is a lot of games on the home computer space that you can't get on console, and you can't see. And I want to get a bigger bigger spectrum of every single video game. Yeah, I asked myself that question too. Why are you releasing this? Why did this game get released? We are playing commercial released games. These are games that a, a publisher picked up and put them out. And they are, they are actual video games that were released. Not prototypes. All right, so let's go to the top. Chrono will move my way back up. Reached a crossover. The roof is weak and a stone is falling on you. Oh, so again, random. All random that happens. Two points of damage. New line to continue. Now, if I was in the UK in 1982, this would be a great title. This would be really fun to play. A turn-based role-playing game that every time you you play, it's a different experience. Every every movement you make in different rooms have new enemies. And like, like I just had a rock fall on me. I, oh, I can also push S to see my status, right? Yeah, there you go, Curtis. That shows your hit points, your spell, gold pieces, monsters, level one, and then it has a total score. So you and you and four friends essentially could play this, and then by the end of the night, look at who has the best score, who's killed the most monsters, gold, and, all, and so forth. Because when you do when you do get in a fight, you have to push the button as fast as you can, and that'll determine your outcome. So it does take that you know quick time event, which doesn't exist yet, but you know what I mean. You know what I mean. We're gonna be playing a game that you have to be fast on the draw at least. All right, so there's a, a brief taste of Dungeons of Doom. I actually could keep playing this one. That's pretty cool. I like this 
for 1982. That's fun. We've seen a few other titles on the ZX81 computer that make the randomness a, a, a good time. Uh, incorporating every time you play something different is going to happen works, especially for this computer. So I'm going to say of all the games we played, I'm going to say Dungeons & Doom is a three and a half star game. It is an above average title. Lots of fun. <laughs> a Twitch game, I don't know about that. But uh, incorporating role-playing elements with having to push the button at a certain time does add a, a level of, of fun. And the randomness, too. So there you go. Three and a half stars for Dungeons of Doom. And with that, we've got to put our video game playing on pause this evening. Welcome to 1982. In May, we're going to be playing all the releases, everything on computer, everything on arcade, everything on home consoles, and... Uh, if you if you go back to 1982, what would you rate these titles on our five star scale? Not not considering anything from nowadays, right now in 1982, what would you if, if you were there? What would you rate these games? That's it for today. And like I always say, Pac-Man Fever doesn't get you. You get Pac-Man Fever. Hey everybody, thanks for checking out the channel and joining me on my quest to play every single video game in order of release. We'll be streaming live every weekday at 9 p.m. Central, so join us and let us know if we missed any games along the way. This video would not be possible without LaunchBox, RetroArch, and MAME. Tell all your friends there's some crazy guy named Chronologically Gaming trying to play every single video game. We have links down below that'll send you to places like our Discord and Patreon, and one that says all the video games we've ever played. If you go there, it's a list of everything, and you can click right to the the game you want to see. Chronologically Gaming is the name to look for. We are perpetually retro and we will catch you next time.